Hey everybody, my name is Ty. I'm the executive pastor here at New Song Church and we just want to welcome you wherever you're watching here today. If you're watching at one of our watch parties at church, if you're at home group or if you're at home, we're just thankful that you're turning in. Today we're going to be talking about one of the most difficult pieces of scripture that I think is in the Bible. And I know I probably say that every time I preach, but this time it's for real. It is loving your enemies and praying for those who persecute you. So you love your enemies, you pray for those who persecute you? Do you think that any time in this world now, the, the world that we're living in, do we have persecution? Do we have any enemies? See, I can love God. That's, that's an easy thing to do, but when you have to love your, your neighbor, I can do that as long as they're like me and they're nice to me and I can be nice back. But, but to love your enemy, that's a, that's a whole nother level. So if you have your Bible, we're going to go to Matthew chapter 5. We're going to start in verse 43. And we're going to go ahead and just finish out chapter 5. So this is Jesus talking. He says, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. So if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? You, therefore, must be perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. You, therefore, must be perfect. That's a tall order. But that's the title of this sermon here today is Perfection, because we're going to unpack a little bit later what that means, that you therefore must be perfect. But first, let's, let's go back to what Jesus said right at the start. He says, you have heard it said that you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. So husband and wife go into uh, the pastor to see his past, their pastor in the office there and and he comes in, the husband, they come in and the husband says, Pastor, we are here because we want to get a divorce and we just want to make sure that you approve of it. Which, honestly, this is a side note here, this, that honestly happens a lot. You know, it's not like they just want to come in and, and say, hey, we want your advice. They kind of really want to tell you what they've already decided and get your stamp of approval on. So that's, I'm not going to go down that road. I'm just going to get myself in trouble. But it happens a lot. But anyway, this husband and the wife, they come and see their pastor. It says, Pastor, we are going to get a divorce. Can you approve that? And so they talk for a little bit, and the pastor looks at the husband and says, you are to love your wife like Christ loved the church. So the husband takes us just some little bit of time to think about that, and he looks at his wife, and he looks back at his pastor, and he looks at his wife again, looks back at his pastor and says, I can't do it. So the pastor's like, okay. Well, you're supposed to love your neighbor as yourself. Can you at least love her like you would love your neighbor? To where the guy says, that's too high of a level. I can't do it. And so finally, a pastor getting frustrated said, okay, you're supposed to love your enemies. Just start there. Now, other than being a pretty clever and well-executed joke, it is also very, very true about what the scripture is saying here when Jesus is saying, love your enemies. He's really saying that the God is giving us no wiggle room here. We're to love everybody that God has actually put into our lives, if it's our spouse, if it's our family, those people that we love, but also every people that we just see every single day and those people also that, that may have lied about you, that gossip about you, that try to cut you down. God is saying, Jesus is saying that, that there is no wiggle room here. We are supposed to love all people. And that's why this scripture is so difficult because our human nature doesn't want to love those who don't love us back. I heard this quote this week that says, returning evil for good is satanic. So when we return evil for good, that's satanic. But returning good for good, that's just simply human. But when we return good for evil, that's divine. That's divine. That is that perfect love that Jesus is talking about in the scripture. That's that perfection that he's talking about. See, love is not simply praised. 
It's commanded. So, knowing that, let's put some, some facts on the table here. People are not easy to love. That's the truth. People are not easy to love. And I know wherever you're at, you're probably nodding your head because you think of some people that aren't easily loved, and you agree. Yes, people are easy to love, not easy to love. Christians, you're in that boat too. You're not easy to love. And I know, well, I, I could see how maybe some Christians may not easy to love, but I'm a spirit-filled believer. Stop. You spirit-filled, difficult person. You are not easy to love. People are not easy to love. Why? Because we love ourselves so much. We love ourselves so much, and people aren't like us. So we can love other Christians because, well, we're in the same spiritual family. We've got the same spiritual goals. I can do that. And I can love my neighbor because... You know, if they're nice to me and, and uh, if they're like me, and, and as long as loving them means I, I care for their general well-being and, and I can be nice and they're nice back. But that's not the love that Jesus is calling us to. That's not what he's saying here. He's calling us to a more mature love. He's calling us to more of a God-like love, that perfect love, that love that says, I have love for everybody, not just people that are like me or kind to me. So Jesus is really calling us to two things in this verse. In this piece of scripture, Jesus is calling us to two things. One is to love your enemy and then pray for those who persecute you. Pray for your enemy. So he's suggesting something new. He's suggesting a radical response to injustice because when people are mean to us, what's our natural response? We're gonna be mean back. If people are kind to us, Kind, kind back. So what Jesus is suggesting is something different. He's, demand, he's saying, don't demand rights. Don't demand your, your rights. Just give them up freely. It's more important for you to give out mercy and give out love and give out forgiveness than it is for you to actually receive it. See, when you love your enemies and you treat them with kindness, what happens? Well, what happens is that you show them and everybody else who really is Lord of your life. You show them the love of Jesus. And we're going to need Jesus to be truly the Lord of our life if we're going to pull this off. Because you're going to need some, some divine help. You're going to need some Holy Spirit help to help you show love to someone who you may not feel love towards. But that's divine and that's that perfect love that Jesus is talking about. Billy Graham says, suppose that I understand the Bible and I'm the greatest preacher who ever lived. The apostle Paul wrote that unless I have love, I am nothing. Without love, we are nothing. So let's unpack a couple statements here that, that Jesus says in this, these verses of scripture here and, and let's see if we can, we can try to learn how we can love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us. First, we gotta understand really how good our God is. Jesus says, he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good, sends rain to the just and the unjust. See, God hates evil. He hates evil but he still is good to all his people. He sends rain to those that, that love him and those who don't love him. He sends the sun to those that worship him and those that don't worship him. Acts 14, 17 says, yet he did not leave himself without witness for he did good by giving you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. He sends rains from heaven, fruitful seasons, satisfies hearts with, with food and gladness. And I think we can all know people in our life that love God, but also people in our life that don't love God, but they are still blessed. They're still, they still have the sun and the rain and the food, and they may be blessed financially. See, God is the lover of all people. I remember a couple of weeks ago that Brandy and I were able to go out on a, on a friend's boat. Thank the Lord with friends with boats, right? So we were out on this friend's boat, and, and I know that Taylor, he talks about going up in the mountains, and he was sending, showing us pictures when he got back after hiking that mountain, and, and just the beautiful pictures of it. And, and that's what, he just really loves that, that scenery and that, that, that atmosphere of being on the mountains. So I feel the same way when I'm on the water, when I'm on the ocean. 
something about it. So we were on our friend's boat, and we were going to Lopez, and we, we docked, and, and we could see the mounds, you could see the islands. It was a sunny day, it was beautiful, and, and I have my favorite chair on that boat, and I just, I'm continually just thanking God for what I'm able to witness. I mean, it was, it was just beautiful, and, and, and I was just continually thanking him and thanking him, but, but here's the deal. There was a lot of people on that island, and I know that not everybody loved God, but they were still able to see what I was able to see and appreciate what I was able to appreciate and to, to, to be a part of what I was able to be a part of. See, God is, is so kind because our nature is if you're kind to us, if, 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 if I think you're worthy of something, then I'll give it to you. But God doesn't do that. It's like if God was, was talking to the people of Washington State and said, okay, people of Washington State, I got to get a better God voice. But anyway, this is it. People of Washington State, for those who love me, I'm giving you Mount Baker. I'm giving you the mountains. I'm giving you the ocean and the lakes. It's a beautiful green area with the trees, and, and I'm going to bless you with that. Now, people who don't love me, you guys get Tacoma. But he doesn't do that. We all don't have to go to Tacoma. We can all view and, and be a part of what God has created. So that's how good our God is. He doesn't withhold good things, but we do and we can. And when we get to the point where, where we're not withholding either, that's when we get to that divine love. That's when we get to that perfect love that Jesus is talking about. He also says, for if you love those who love you, what reward will you have? See, our natural response is payback. If it's good or bad or anywhere in between, if you're kind to me, then I'm going to be kind to you. If you do me a favor, I'm going to do you a favor. If you pray for me, I'll pray for you. And if you're mean to me, then I'm going to make you feel uncomfortable as well. See, that's our natural response is to, to love who loves us and to kind, be kind to those who are kind to us because we are what goes around comes around, and that's kind of how we live. But Jesus is calling his disciples to something greater. He's even saying, you know, look at, look at the tax collectors. Even they do that. But I'm calling you to something greater. Everybody in the world is kind to those who are kind to you. Jesus is calling us to something greater. I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. But why would we do that? How can we get that strength? Well, we can look in the Bible for an example, and in Romans 5, 8, Paul puts it this way, God demonstrated his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We can love our enemies because God loved us while we were his. While we were set apart, while we were still sinners, God loves us anyway. We were going against anything that, that, that God stands for, and he loves us so much that he sent Jesus to die on the cross to take our place, that God loves a sinner. And that's what he did, and so that's what he's asking us to do. See, the love of God, the love of God is love for the unworthy. It's love for the unworthy. We don't deserve the love of God. We don't deserve God's goodness. So he gives love to the unworthy. And what Jesus is saying is, can you do the same? Can you give love to someone that maybe you feel like is unworthy of it? And we're able to do this because of the love that God gives us. 1 John 4, 19, we love because he first loved us. He first loved us. The love we receive is what we're able to pour out. Now, Taylor talked about this a little bit last week. Now, loving your enemies, praying for those that persecute you does not equal doormat. Doesn't equal that you can just let people continually cross boundaries and hurt you and cut you and steal from you and cheat on you and lie. And there's boundaries that we, we have to put in place so people don't cross it. But at the same time, this verse gives us a really good, a good time to kind of do a spiritual gut check on some things. Is there a person or is there a group of people in your life where God is calling you to maybe grow an extra layer of skin for? 
Maybe he's saying, you need to be a little bit more patient with this person or these people. Maybe you need to be a little bit more forgiven. How about this? How about instead of complaining about someone, maybe you need to walk in their shoes a little bit first. Understand how they're living, what's going on in their life, and try to seek to understand what's going on there before you just go out with the venom. Is there a group of people, is there someone that God God is saying, you know, there's an area in your life where you need to stop being so easily offended? That's the perfect love that Jesus is talking about. It's to stop doing those things. And, and, and Jesus says, be perfect. Therefore, your hev- as your heavenly Father is perfect. See, we're never perfect in this life. We're sinful, fallen people. But we can display perfect love. Because Christian love is really a decision. It's a decision. Our goal is to love our spouse the way God loves our spouse. Not when they're just nice to us or, or we're getting along, but, but even those times when they may seem like your enemy. God says, love your kids even though they may rebel. Love your neighbor that gives you grief. Love your boss that seems unreasonable, that coworker that seems hyper-competitive, that person who cheated on you. God says, love them. Forgive them. Pray for them. And this is why I think this is such a hard piece of scripture to do because our natural response is so opposite. But what happens when we pray for them? Does it make the relationship better? It might. It might, but is that the reason why Jesus is instructing us to do this? I think our goal in praying for someone and and, and loving somebody that that we have a hard time with isn't necessarily to, to correct behavior in others. But I think it's because we are the salt and the light. And so we are to reflect the love of God out to other people. And when we can love our enemies and we can pray for those who persecute us, that is really us just showing God's love to a world that absolutely needs to see it. So scripture says, pray for those who persecute you. Basically, pray for your enemies. So how do you do that? Because it's easy. You could do this. I can, well, okay, the scripture says, pray for my enemy. Okay, Lord, I lift up Johnny. And I'm not God, but you are. And I'm not going to tell you how to do your job. So you can do whatever you want. You can bankrupt him if you'd like. Maybe you can make his transmission go out, or you could just set a, send a lightning bolt. That, whatever you want to do, but I'm praying for my enemy. No, that's not what he's saying. What else he's not saying is, is rem, trying to remind God of the sins of another person. Lord Johnny, you know he's such a liar. You know he's a thief, and you know he says some things. God, And remember what he did last week when, when he said that, and when he did, oh, Lord, Fix him, fix him, Lord. No, that's not it. You don't need to remind God of the sins of someone else. But what if he's saying to pray for your enemies, not to complain about them or ask them to change, but what if if it's more like, God, will you make me more like you? And will you help me love this person like you love this person? God, help me to greet those that give me the cold shoulder. God, help me to be kind to those who are just mean to me, who have said some nasty things about me. See, praying for your enemies isn't about about necessarily changing them. See, you can pray for your enemies, and, and it may change them, but really, this prayer of praying for your enemies is a prayer that changes you. It's a prayer that changes you. See, it's hard to hate someone that you're praying for especially if you're praying for them by name. When you're praying every day for someone, for for God to bless them, to prosper them, you're praying for their family, you're praying for their forgiveness, you're praying for all of that, it becomes really, really difficult to hate somebody. See, it's a prayer that changes you. So is it possible that as you pray for your enemies, uh, who you consider your enemies anyway, that in time you grow to actually genuinely love and care for them? Not love and care for their conduct. That could be ungodly or immoral. You don't have to love their character. 
but can you just simply love them? Praying for those who, who have cut you, that, that have lied about you, that gossiped about you, stole from you, cheated on you, go against people that go against what, what this book stands for. What's our response to that? God says, pray for them and love them. What would this world look like today if we truly lived out this scripture to love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you? Would there be so many riots and protests? Would we have so much division and hatred? What about fear and anger? Would there be so much of that? So pray for your enemies. So the question that we have to answer the question we have to ask ourselves then, church, is who is your enemy? If you look at the book of Ephesians, it says that our battle is not against, against flesh and bone, so our enemy is not people to begin with. And so that's, that's important to understand, that our battle is not against flesh and bone, but some people, some people are, mm, some people. But what's our response? Our response is to pray for them. To love them. You can do more for a person on your knees than you can complaining about them to someone else. So how about this? What about all the riots and protests that we see every night going on in Seattle or Portland? Do we see them as your enemy? Word got out last week, two weeks ago, I can't remember, but I read this headline where in Portland, they're burning American flags and they're also burning the Bible. What's our response to that? Is it right to even be mad at that? I hope it's okay to be mad at that. If not, I've been sinned for a long time. And I think it is okay to be mad at that. That's that righteous anger we talked about a few weeks ago. But how do we respond? Taylor talked about President Trump and Jay Inslee last week, which actually made me mad because I had that in my sermon notes too. But now he made the point, and so... I pray for Taylor now because he made me mad, but I still love him. So, but he made a great point about praying for Trump or praying for Jay Inslee, depending, no matter what side you land on. I'll tell you, and one of the things I put in the notes here is, is that we can do so much more for our president or our governor on our knees than we can typing on social media or go and have a beer with your friends and talk politics and complain about and get everybody in agreement and just complain and complain. Yeah, it's okay that, that if they're going against what you stand for in the Bible, yeah, we have to stand up. We have to rise against that. But at the same time, a lot of us, we, one of the things that God really spoke to me during this, I don't feel like I honestly complain too much about politics, comparatively. I'm gonna give myself a pass. I don't complain a whole lot. But one of the things that really God said really loudly during this week when I was preparing for this is, Ty, are you willing to pray for them as much as you are complaining about them? Now, if I don't feel like I complain that much, that tells you how little I was actually praying for them. But church, I'm going to ask you the same thing. Depending on who you're talking to, if it's our president or if it's our governor, or if it's those people that are protesting, those people that are burning flags and Bibles that just make our blood boil, are you willing to pray for them as much as you're willing to complain about them? See, we've been shown so much love and so much grace and so much forgiveness. And Jesus is saying, you received so much of that. Will you, are you willing to pour some of that back out? That's the perfection that Jesus was talking about. See, hurt people hurt people. That's a very true statement. When you're hurt, hurt people hurt people, but forgiven people, then we forgive. Forgiven people forgive people. Amber Geiger just finished a 13-hour shift as a Dallas police officer and was on her way home. She was texting her boyfriend, who was also a cop. She pulled into her parking garage, distracted and tired, and did not notice she parked on the wrong level. So when she entered and walked into what she thought was her apartment, she encountered a man named Botham John. Terrified, she drew her service weapon 
and shot him in the heart, killing him. It was only afterwards that she realized that she was in the wrong apartment, one floor above, and she killed an innocent man in his own home. Amber Geiger was found guilty of murder, convicted of 10 years in prison. And during the in victim impact statements, Botham John's brother, Brant, changed the entire dynamics of the proceeding when he decided to address Amber. And this is what he says. He says, I love you just like anyone else. I'm not going to say, I'm not going to be up here. I'm not going to say that I hope that you rot and die. I personally want the best for you. And I wasn't even going to say this in front of my family or, or anyone else, but I don't even want you to go to jail. I want the best for you because I know that's exactly what my brother would want. And the best for you would be to give your life to Christ. After wrapping up his statement, Brandt asked the judge, Tammy Kemp, if, if he could give Geiger a hug. He says, I don't know if it's possible, but can I please go give her a hug? And the judge didn't respond. And, and after the second plea, she said, go ahead. So shortly after, he and Geiger embraced each other for nearly a minute. Both, and then after that, both returned to their seats. A few minutes later, the brother, Brant, he got up. And he walked out of the courtroom. And he received a thumbs up from his father, who was also sitting there watching the proceedings. Judge Tammy Kemp then got up out of her chair and left. But when she returned a few moments later, she came back with her own personal Bible. And she went over to Geiger and made reference to John 3.16 and gave her the Bible. And she said, you only need a tiny mustard seed of faith. You start with this. And then the judge hugged Geiger and, and whispered something. And Geiger whispered something into the ear. And, and, and I was watching some of the YouTube clips. And, and basically, you could hear her saying, do you think God will ever forgive me? And then the judge says, you haven't done so much that you can't be forgiven. You did something bad in one moment. But what you do now matters. And then Geiger was led away to start her prison sentence. And the judge came under really harsh criticism for her actions, but the prosecutor said everything changed in the courtroom once Brandt's testimony came out. Those who wanted an eye for an eye, those who wanted severe justice, that, that all kind of just melted away, and, and there were a lot of tears in the courtroom. That story is a picture of the power of loving your enemies and praying for those who persecute you. This brother, this, this man who was shot, the brother came and, and nobody would have, would have even given it a second thought if he would have looked at this lady as a murderer, as someone that was evil, and he would demand justice and he would demand the harshest penalty, but instead he made a decision. This man was so filled with the love of Jesus that he made a decision, and his decision was this, I'm going to love this person. And it changed. Not, it not only released probably any emotional prison that he would have, could have easily got himself into, but it, it changed this woman's life for eternity. Yeah, she still had to go to prison. Sometimes there's consequences for sin. There's consequences for bad decisions. But she got a Bible that day. And she received forgiveness that day. And I promise you that she was released of a lot of things. She, 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 at one point in the, during the testimony, she said, I wish it was him that had the gun. And that she died. And that she would never forgive herself. But now here's the brother offering forgiveness. The point of all this is, is if people who follow Jesus are no different than anybody else, then what impact are we going to have? And this is why this piece of scripture is so, so important because it really does describe the gospel. We're supposed to pray for those that are burning Bibles, burning flags, and going against our political beliefs. How are we supposed to do that? Well, when Jesus was hanging on a cross and people were beating him and whipping him and spitting on him and mocking him, what did he say? Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. We need to start praying like Jesus prayed. 
Father, forgive those that are burning those Bibles. Forgive those that are burning those flags. Forgive those who, who, are, who are against. They don't know what they're doing. They need Jesus. And some of you here that are, are watching need to hear this story as well, that, that, that what, what, what the judge said to, to that cop, you haven't done so much that you can't be forgiven. What you do now matters. There are people that you have allowed yourself to be in bondage from your past. And I'm saying that Jesus is saying, you haven't done so much that you haven't been forgiven. Jesus died on the cross for you because he loves you. That same love that that brother had for, for, for the one that killed his brother. It says, I don't even want you to rot and die. I don't even want the best for you. I don't even want you to go to jail. Jesus is saying, I don't want you to go to eternity of hell. I want the best for you. Come and, and, and see me, find me. That's the love of Jesus. That I don't want, there's nothing that you have done that you can't be forgiven. I don't want you to rot and die. I want the best for you. You haven't done so much that you haven't been, that you can't be forgiven. My question is, has someone done something to you that is so much that you can't offer that same forgiveness to them? That's that perfect love. That's that divine love. That's that loving your enemies and praying for those who persecute you. This is the, one of the most difficult commands in the Bible. But what, church, if we are willing to do this, if we're willing to take what Jesus says and love our enemies, if we're willing to, to stop complaining and, and walk in someone else's shoes and start praying for those who persecute us, that have hurt us, if we're willing to do that, yes, it may change someone else's life. It may not change someone else's life, but I promise you, it is a prayer that will change you. It will change you. So let's pray. Lord, we're so thankful for this piece of scripture. As difficult as it is to love those who wrong us and hurt us. God, we just appreciate, Jesus, your example of this perfect love. Lord, that as you hung on the cross for us, doing something that we can't do for ourselves, I tell you, people are doing worse things to you than they are today in this world. And your response to them was, God, forgive them. Father, forgive them. They just don't know what they're doing. So Lord, will you give us that heart? Will you give us those eyes and those feelings for your people to love all people, those that we feel are worthy of it and those who we feel are not worthy of it? Because that's how we're going to show this world the love of God is to really just be able to reflect that. So God, will you give us opportunity to do that? Will you give us boldness to do that? And will you help us understand that it really just simply is a decision, will we do that? And we pray that you are glorified and praised well in our life as we try to live this out the best we can. And we love you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.